Chapter 22 of Ashton Kirk, Secret Agent, by John Thomas McIntyre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pete Milan. Chapter 22 The German Embassy Ball. The street before the German Embassy was thronged with motor cars and carriages. The windows sparkled with lights. Lines of police sharply directed traffic and saw to it that the space before the building was kept open. It was perhaps eleven o'clock when Ashton Kirk, accompanied by Fuller, arrived. The latter gazed about the glittering rooms, astonished. I'm not sure which it most resembles, he said. A masked ball without the masks? Or an ensemble number in a musical comedy? The women were magnificent. Their gowns shone. Their shoulders and arms gleamed under the many lights. The officers attached to the various embassies made a dashing picture in their gorgeous uniforms. The official dress of the diplomats was stately and picturesque. Here was a white-haired old Austrian, his chest a glitter with crosses and orders, engaged with the Turkish envoy. The Chinese minister, his flowing silken robes tucked in about him, sat placidly in the midst of a group of admiring ladies. The flaming scarlet and gold lace of one South American republic contrasted strongly with the white and silver of another. Mexico vied with Russia in splendor, while less spectacular states ran from sober greens and grays to the plain black of conventional dress. Plants and lights were everywhere. From the ballroom came the strains of a German waltz. The dancers floated about upon the shining floor. The handsome Baroness von Stunenberg greeted the secret agent and his aide. The ambassador, who was a massive man with a snowy, uptwisted mustache and the stride of a Prussian cavalryman, stood nearby. I was informed of your coming, he said to Ashton Kirk, and although I do not quite understand, still I am pleased to see you. The secret agent had replied, and von Stunenberg was turning away when a delighted voice exclaimed, Kirk, old chap, I'm astonished! Here of all places in the world! Ashton Kirk turned and came face to face with a brilliantly beautiful woman, and a young man with a vastly contented look. "'Mrs. Pendleton,' said the secret agent, as he took the outstretched hand. "'I can only repeat your husband's exclamation, here of all places in the world.' "'But what does it mean?' demanded Jimmy Pendleton, as he too gripped his friend by the hand. "'Here you are, you whom I have heard discourse so wisely about such affairs as this.' the folly and the vanity of it, and the... But he paused, snapped his fingers, and turned to his wife. I know what it is. He's here on business. Mrs. Pendleton gestured her dismay. Not that, surely, she said. There can scarcely be anything here to attract your talents. Laughingly to the secret agent. Ambassadors are the frankest of men, and their doings are open to everyone. The Baroness and Edith are cronies, Pendleton informed the other, as his wife turned to the hostess. The latter's expression, as Mrs. Pendleton spoke to her in a low tone, changed formal politeness to one of interest. Oh, she said, my dear, I'm afraid of him. And so, smiling to Ashton Kirk, you are the remarkable person of whom Mrs. Pendleton has spoken so often? Well, if I ever become involved in a mystery, I promise to call in no one but you. I shall be flattered by your confidence, said Ashton Kirk, in the same light tone. But I warn you, Mrs. Pendleton is scarcely to be depended upon as regards my work. She allowed herself to be dazzled by a trifling dexterity, so to speak, and makes a very wonderful performance of something that was not at all remarkable. Oh, these modest men, signed the Baroness. 
The world is so full of them. In turn, she spoke a few words to her husband. His big German head reared, and he curled the upstanding points of his mustache. I have heard of you, sir. And his blue eyes searched the secret agent from head to foot. The old boy seems somewhat miffed, whispered Pendleton to Fuller. I wonder what's wrong. He probably does not fancy being interfered with, said Fuller, and he shrugged his shoulders wisely. Why, and Pendleton looked astonished, you don't mean to say that he... Here he paused, and his glance was full of inquiry. No, nothing directly, answered Fuller. Just a little affair that seems to have been put up to him, that's all. There was a brief, low-pitched conversation between Ashton Kirk and von Stunenberg. The latter's manner was one of massive dignity, and not once while he spoke did he take his light-colored eyes from the face of the secret agent. But if he expected to read anything there, he was disappointed. Ashton Kirk was smilingly candid, genially open. But he said nothing that would throw light upon his errand there that night. The Baron had served under Bismarck, and his methods were identical with those of the great Chancellor. The sappers worked constantly under cover of a blunt manner and pointed speech. But in this case the blunt manner pounded vainly against an impregnable wall of practiced assurance, and the pointed speeches met with a flashing defense. Impatiently, the old diplomat twisted his white mustache, and rather angrily he drew off his sappers, for they were useless except under cover of their more obvious brethren. "'I thank you, sir,' said he, with a bow. "'To have seen you is a pleasure, and now you will pardon me, I know.' A little later, Ashton Kirk sat with Mrs. Pendleton in a secluded corner. "'Now,' she said, holding up one finger. Tell me all about it. Don't try to deceive me. I know the Baron von Stunenberg very well, and have never seen him assume that manner of a few moments ago, unless there was something of much importance going forward. The Baron flatters me by his manner, smiled Ashton Kirk. It puts me in quite a glow to think that I am so noticed in high places. She laughed musically, but her eyes were not without their gravity. "'I know you of old,' she said. "'You will tell nothing until you are ready. "'That characteristic made me afraid of you once. "'But in the midst of the fear there was a good deal of admiration,' she confessed, with a nod of her stately head. "'If you impress everyone as you impressed me, "'that is, everyone you are working against,' I don't wonder you always succeed. Even while I planned, I knew that I could not hide from you that which you wished to know. You were clever, he said, and you were resourceful. You lacked only experience. While he spoke, his eyes went about from place to place as though seeking someone. Are you acquainted with many here tonight? he asked. Not many was the answer. She noticed the roving of the singular eyes, and her interest quickened. Did you expect to see someone? she inquired. He nodded. I wonder if I know who it is. She paused for an answer, but he seemed not to hear, and so she went on. Someone who has done something amiss. Poor thing. Do you know I feel sorry for him? Then, after a pause, a man, of course. He shook his head. It's a woman. Her voice lifted. It's a woman, she repeated. Oh, poor creature. She turned upon him two fine eyes filled with concern. Perhaps it's a girl, she said. A girl much like I was. One who can confide in no one or has no one whom she can trust. Tell me, what is her... Just then, in the midst of a group which was about separating, Ashton Kirk caught sight of Stella Corbin. 
Mrs. Pendleton noted his expression. Her eyes followed the direction of his own. And when they rested upon the slight girlish figure and saw the eager, frightened look, she turned upon him. For shame, she said reproachfully. Oh, for shame! You know her then, said he quietly. I only know that she is an English girl and came here with Madame Steinmetz. But, and her brilliant, challenging glance met his own squarely, I know that she has done nothing. A girl who looks like that could not do anything very wrong. It is not always well to judge by appearances, said he quietly. Physiognomists place great confidence in their power to read faces, but theirs is scarcely an exact science. She sat regarding him steadfastly, then nodded and said, That is mere evasion. I recognize the ruse, for I have met it once or twice before. You draw upon generalities when questioned in a specific instance. And if your questioner takes that as a direct answer, you do not trouble yourself to put him or her right. He smiled. I said that you needed only experience, he remarked. Just then, a sleek little form came rolling into view. The rosy face, shining bald head, and the decoration were familiar to the secret agent. Mrs. Pendleton, said the German, and he nodded and waved his hand. I am giving much pleasure to see you. How do you do, Colonel Stelsner? she replied. Then, inquiringly, you have met Mr. Ashton Kirk? I have met him, yes, but I have not before caught the name. Colonel Stelsner bowed until his gleaming scalp was fully in view. It gratifies me, sir, to know so famous a person, he concluded. Ah, you two have heard of him? Mrs. Pendleton smiled mischievously. The little German again waved his hand. Who has not? he demanded. Everyone, authoritatively, on both sides of the ocean. That is... And the hand was held up, as though begging a moment's delay in her judgment. Everyone who is interested such matters in? Here Pendleton came up with some friends, to whom he presented the secret agent. A few moments later, a manservant approached the latter and said something to him. Ashton Kirk asked to be pardoned and followed the servant out of the room. But Mrs. Pendleton took no notice of all this. She gave all her attention to the little German. He polished his glittering scalp and chuckled. Most secret agents, he went on, are unknown to the public. They cherish the fancy that they are almost unknown to the diplomatic corps. But it is only fancy. Those who are unknown personally are recognized by their methods. Ah, yeah. They are as open as the day. A man who no eyes has could see it. But he... And he indicated the spot where Ashton Kirk had stood with one plump forefinger. There is one who is not like the others. No, no. He shook his head, and his chuckle grew more pronounced. He is much different. Ashton Kirk returned in a few moments, and was soon talking generally with Pendleton's friends, who were mostly young people who laughed a great deal. And while he did not miss a word of what was said, Neither did he once take his eyes from that point where Stella Corbin still sat. With her was a small, vivacious, pretty woman, undoubtedly French, whose gestures were most eloquent, and the play of whose eyes alone was almost sufficient to tell a close observer what she was saying. Some little distance away was a heavy-jowled man with thick black brows and a slow way of turning his small head. In close conversation with him was a slighter man, blonde, and with a short, pointed beard. 
and for all their apparent occupation in each other's words, their glances kept constantly going toward Miss Corbin and her companion. Each movement made by them seemed a matter of intense interest. And in this they were not alone. Behind where the girl sat ran a massive marble staircase, which led to a sort of balcony, palm-lined, and used as a resting place by tired dancers, and a point of vantage by those who merely desired to look on. At the top of the staircase, seated beneath a wide-spreading and flowering plant, were Matsadi and, yes, it was Okiu. Fuller caught sight of this latter pair much about the same time as his employer. The secret agent nodded in answer to the young man's low, surprised whisper. Yes, I just noticed them, he said. Fuller turned his glance from Okiu to Stella Corbin. That he was puzzled was frankly shown. This is a rather queer situation, he said, in a low, careful tone to Ashton Kirk. Japan wanted that paper in the worst way, and this Corbin girl stood in with Okiu in an effort to gain possession of it for that government. And now, with the document in their possession, they began a flirtation, so to speak, with the Germans. But the secret agent made no reply to this, except to give his helper a warning look. Then he plunged into the conversation which the others were carrying on animatedly. The eyes of the beautiful Mrs. Pendleton had kept Stella Corbin well within range. Both the girl and her companion seemed to interest her greatly. And so, she said to Colonel Stelsner, you think Mr. Ashton Kirk very different from the other government agents? He gestured with both hands. As different as the sun from the stars, declared he. The mastery of his art has been to him given. Everyone knows him by sight. Everyone knows him for what he is. And yet he works in such a way that his hand is not noticed until it has closed. Here he pantomimed expansively. And what he has been seeking is in its grasp. The dance music came to them in swaying, stirring strains. The low laughter and sound of gliding feet came with it. Madame von Steinmetz, spoke Mrs. Pendleton after a few moments, is a remarkably expressive woman. The eyes of the little German went to the lady who was conversing with Stella Corbin. His shoulders shrugged and his hands opened wide. It is her race, he said. The French are mostly so. There is her husband now. And his gaze singled out the man with the pointed blonde beard. He is German, and has little of the characteristics which mark her. How long have they been married? asked Mrs. Pendleton. About ten years, I believe. So long as that? She seemed greatly surprised. I thought that men did not remain in love with their wives for so great a length of time. And yet he is much in love with her. See? He can't keep his eyes from her. Colonel Stelsner's little round body shook, as probably it had never shaken before. He chuckled and gasped. The tears stood in his eyes. Oh, you ladies, he said at last. Oh, you ladies, you see everything. Nothing escapes you. Again he shook and chuckled and gasped. But finally he recovered, wiped his eyes, and went on. Ah, yes, I suppose von Steinmetz is desperately in love with madame. And why not? She is charming. Who is that with von Steinmetz? she asked. That? Oh. And the round little colonel nodded his head knowingly. That is Hoffa. Her eyes lingered upon the large-jowled man for a moment. She had heard of him. I trust, she smiled, that Herr Hoffer is not also in love with Madame von Steinmetz. Stelsner chuckled. 
"'It is not possible that you think he might be,' he protested. "'Well, he seems inclined to pay her as much attention as her husband. "'His eyes never move from her.' "'Oh!' gasped Colonel Stelsner. "'You will be the death of me, Mrs. Pendleton. You really will!' <laughs> and when he had recovered from the fit of laughter into which her observation had thrown him, he added, "'But consider, Madame von Steinmetz is not alone. Could it not be possible that Hoffer is interested in the English girl?' Her fine eyes were fixed directly upon his face, as she said, "'Ah, that is it.' There was something in her tone which drove the laugh from his face. He answered soberly enough, "'I ask if it were not possible, that is all.' People who talk too much upon subjects regarding which it is best that they be silent often get glimpses of their weakness, and Colonel Stelsner had such a flash of inner vision just then. And while he was, more or less dismayed, thinking it over, Mrs. Pendleton discovered Matsadi and Okiu at the head of the staircase. The interest which they displayed in the two women immediately attracted her, and once more she turned to the little colonel. The two Japanese now, which of the ladies attracts them, the English or the French? The usually rosy face of Stelsner was rather gray as he replied, and the chuckle, so habitual to him, had given place to a wan smile. "'The Japanese,' said he. "'Oh, yes, those two up there, of course. I have found,' with the air of a man speaking more or less at random, "'that the Occidental types of women interest Orientals. Oh, yes, it is much so.' I have known Japanese to admire. Ah, Hoffer, how do you do? The heavy man, accompanied by von Steinmetz, was moving by, and Stelsner grasped at their passing as a shipwrecked seaman might grasp at a spar. Reluctantly, so it seemed, the two men paused, and the beautiful Mrs. Pendleton smiled as she bent her head to the salutation of von Steinmetz. Your wife, she said, is lovely tonight. We have just been admiring her. The husband seemed none too pleased at this. He fingered his short, light-colored beard, and his small blue eyes went to the lady in question. It occurred to me also, he said, that she looked well. But then, and he smiled a little, I think she usually looks so. You are a good husband and Mrs. Pendleton laughed lightly. Madam should be proud of you. But, and she arched her brows in wonder, what an exceedingly interesting girl Miss Corbin must be. See how she holds Madam's attention. Even the slightest gesture seems loaded with meaning. The slim fingers of von Steinmetz tugged at the pointed beard. Hoffer turned his head with his peculiarly slow motion toward the speaker and his eyes searched her face. But there was nothing there but smiles and bright looks and admiration for what she apparently considered a marked talent. That Madame von Steinmetz seemed greatly interested in what Stella Corbin said was plain enough. Her eloquent hands were still. Her eyes had ceased their byplay and centered themselves upon the girl's face. This latter was even paler than usual, and her face seemed a trifle set. Her attitude was one that told of suppressed excitement. In a throaty German which was sharply distressing, Hoffer began relating a heavy anecdote. Both von Steinmetz and Stelsner gave it much attention. But Mrs. Pendleton, while she listened, never took her eyes from Stella Corbin and her companion. For the girl had ceased speaking, and leaned back in her chair, as though exhausted. Madame von Steinmetz, her vivacious countenance illumined, was carefully outlining something for the girl's benefit. Hoffer finished the anecdote, and his two friends laughed eagerly. Mrs. Pendleton smiled, and nodded her appreciation, 
though it is doubtful if she had heard much of it. To von Steinmetz she said, How wonderfully expressive your wife's manner is. See, it is almost as if we could hear what she is saying. That von Steinmetz would have vastly preferred his lady's manner to have been less wonderful was evident. His blue eyes were cold with disapproval. The pointed beard was twisted and tugged painfully. And while she was manifesting this interest in Miss Corbin and the Frenchwoman, Mrs. Pendleton did not altogether lose sight of Ashton Kirk. She noted that, in a few minutes, he drew away from the group of which her husband made one. And also she noted that his eyes, though they did not seem to do so, never lost a movement made by Stella Corbin. The two Japanese, as though they had caught sight of someone or something upon the lower floor, had suddenly arisen and descended the staircase. The Signor Maselli, murmured Mrs. Pendleton, as she saw Matsadi speak to a beautiful dark-eyed woman, evidently an Italian. He is asking her to sing. And that Signora Maselli was willing to do so was apparent. For she took Matsadi's arm and they crossed to a room, the door of which was only a few feet from where Miss Corbin and Madame von Steinmetz sat. Okiu, however, remained behind, and as Matsadi was passing through the door, he turned to look over his shoulder toward his countrymen, which, to a close observer, seemed full of significance. Madame von Steinmetz still talked, eagerly, with her hands, eyes, and tongue. It were as though, as Mrs. Pendleton thought, the English girl had pictured some dilemma in which she stood, and the Frenchwoman was pointing the way out. More than once, Miss Corbin's hands had gone toward the bag which hung from her arm. But each time they left it unopened, as though she were not altogether persuaded. But, Mrs. Pendleton told herself with conviction, she will do it in the end. When one is anxious to take advice, one usually does so. The dance music had stopped some little time before. Now came the notes of a piano, almost immediately followed by the rush and ring of a human voice. Heads were turned, laughter stopped, voices ceased. Then there was a stir. It is Maselli, ran the whisper. A movement began toward the room from which the singing proceeded. In a moment, Mrs. Pendleton's view of Stella Corbin was cut off by the eager and somewhat undignified scamper. Through the press she saw the sleek black head of Okiu, and, at no great distance, caught a glimpse of Ashton Kirk. A sort of fluttering assailed her eardrums. It were as though the air were charged with an impending, unseen something. A feeling of suspense filled her. She was astonished to feel herself possessed by an almost irresistible desire to cry out a warning to some indefinite person. And apparently she was not alone in her impression, for now she saw Hoffer, his great jaws rigid, almost thrusting his way forward among the guests. Von Steinmetz and Stelsner were also on the move, and from different directions. Suddenly, there was a pistol shot. Startled cries rang out. The throng split as though divided by a great knife. And as it fell asunder, there arose another cry, higher and in a different key. The first had been the outcry of those who felt harm impending. The second was that of a single person, and one upon whom the harm had fallen. It was Miss Corbin. Mrs. Pendleton could see her as she stood, white and startled, staring at the silken bag which she held in her arms. Upon one side of her stood Madame von Steinmetz, aghast, trembling with shock. Upon the other stood Ashton Kirk, imperturbable and keen-eyed. For an instant the affrighted guest swayed upon the verge of panic. Then, like oil upon troubled waters, 
soothing words were spoken, and explanations suavely proffered. A young man, who looked very red and foolish, had dropped and exploded a chamber of a newly invented revolver, which he had brought to exhibit to an influential official whom he expected to meet. And in the ensuing excitement, Miss Corbin had lost a cherished trifle, which would, no doubt, be found shortly. Startled people are always anxious to be convinced that there is no occasion for their alarm. And so, more or less satisfied, von Stunenberg's guests broke into laughter and relieved chatter. Passing through little groups, all absorbed in the enjoyment of relating their mutual sensations, Ashton Kirk made his way toward the hall. His step was unhurried, his manner nonchalant. He spoke lightly to a number of people as he went by. As he turned into the hall, Mrs. Pendleton followed. She saw him disappear into the coat room and reappear a moment later, his overcoat on and his hat in his hand. And at the same instant, she saw him confronted by the burly forms of Hoffer and the Baron von Studenberg. End of Chapter 22《Chapter 23 of Ashton Kirk, Secret Agent by John Thomas McIntyre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pete Milan. Chapter 23 What von Stunenberg Thought. For a moment, the secret agent and the two Germans stood face to face. Then the former said, smilingly, I am sorry to be forced to go at such an early hour, but... And he lifted his brows in such a way that might mean much, or little. There are certain things which require my attention. Von Stunenberg twisted one point of his white mustache, and his blue eyes glinted coldly. It would grieve me to keep you from your affairs, said he in his rumbling voice, but there is a trifling matter which I should like to discuss with you. It will require perhaps only a few moments. The length of time altogether depends upon yourself. I shall be only too glad, said Ashton Kirk agreeably. He glanced at his watch and then added, but since you say that the length of time depends upon me, I will make it as short as possible. It is more than likely that my presence will be urgently needed, quite a little distance from here, in perhaps half an hour. There was a small room at one side, and the German ambassador entered this, followed by the others. Will you sit down? he asked, with grave politeness. The secret agent did so. Hoffer also seated himself. His small head was drawn down upon his big shoulders. The heavy face worked spasmodically. The veins and cords of his tightly clenched hands stood out in high relief. It would be a waste of time for us to indulge in any preamble, spoke von Stunenberg coldly. I know why you came here tonight and I know that you have been in some degree successful in your errand. And so, as that ground is covered, there is no need to go over it again. Ashton Kirk leaned back in his chair, and his white, even teeth shone as he smiled. I have always found it best to examine my ground. Leaping over it is seldom satisfactory, said he. You say that you know why I came here tonight. We will not discuss that if you are opposed to so doing. And again, the quick smile showed itself. But as to your knowing I have been in some degree successful, that is open to debate. Hoffer protruded his small head slowly, much as a turtle might do. Of course, said he, we expected you to deny it. But you're making a statement, and are accepting it, 
are two different matters. Ashton Kirk nodded. To be sure, said he, calmly. Hoffer was about to say something more, but his chief held up a hand. A certain instrument was about to pass into my possession tonight, said von Stunenberg to Ashton Kirk. You knew of this, and came here to prevent our being entrusted with it if you could. You are an able man, Mr. Ashton Kirk, but do not forget that we still have the faculty of vision. Neither are we in the habit of allowing things to be taken from beneath our noses. You represent a friendly power, said Ashton Kirk, coldly, and of course could have no desire in the matter of the instrument in question other than to hand it with your compliments to this government. Von Stunenberg nodded. Of course, said Hoffer. And it was so understood by others and myself, proceeded Ashton Kirk. But there was a chance. I am perfectly frank, you see, that there might be a desire upon your part to make sure that the document in question was really what you supposed it. To venture to examine it would be a matter of delicacy. And the speaker's voice was suavity itself. And so I concluded that it were a rather friendly thing to save you any mental wrench of that sort by anticipating you. That, said von Stunenberg, and the smoothness of his voice was not a whit behind that of the other, was most considerate of you. Accept my thanks. But... And his blue eyes were wide open in the fixity of the look which he directed toward the secret agent. We would much prefer to assume our own responsibilities. There was a short pause. Then the ambassador leaned a trifle toward the other. And so, he resumed, I should take it as a further expression of your good will, if you would hand the paper to me immediately. Ashton Kirk rose and looked at his watch once more. My time is short, said he. So if there is anything of importance, I beg that you mention it at once. Von Stunenberg twisted his up-pointing mustache. His blue eyes were like ice. His manner was grim and menacing. There is nothing to be gained by this attitude, said he. We are not children to be so deceived. You are not children to be so deceived. Ashton Kirk smiled as he repeated the ambassador's words. Perhaps not, but Metsadi apparently fancied it not very difficult when he arranged his little scene a few minutes ago. Von Stunenberg cast a quick look at Hoffer. The latter's small head turned slowly upon the secret agent. Matsadi did arrange the scene, said he, and there was admiration in his voice. No stage manager could have done better. He had not watched the English girl more than a moment when he saw, as did you and I, with a conclusive wave of the hand, that the papers desired were in the bag at her side. At sight of the Italian woman, he grasped his opportunity for creating a momentary ruffle. In the midst of this, at a signal, his confederate allowed the revolver to explode so transforming the slight confusion into a panic. During this, his agent was to abstract the document. Ashton Kirk nodded, after the manner of one workman exchanging experiences with another. That was not all that I saw, went on Hoffer. I saw Matsati's agent making his way toward Miss Corbin to play his part before the discharge of the revolver. Also, and the big jaws tightened, I saw you doing your best to anticipate him. Ashton Kirk laughed, and there was an odd expression in his singular eyes. Was there nothing more that you noticed? He asked. 
It was sufficient, put in von Stunenberg grimly, that he saw you reach the girl's side before the Japanese. And, if anything more were needed, an instant after you got within reaching distance, Miss Corbin discovered that the papers were gone. And that Okiu was baffled, said Hoffer. One had only to give him a chance to discover. The rage in his face showed that you had beaten them, that you had taken the prize out of their own trap. Ashton Kirk laughed once more. My dear sir, said he, you credit me with a dexterity which I do not possess. It is true that I did. He paused, and then turned to Hoffer. Aside from Okiu, did you see anyone else of Matsadi's? No. Upon the fact that I reached Miss Corbin's side before Okiu, you base your belief that I must have secured the paper. Ashton Kirk placed his fingertips together with great nicety, and then looked placidly at Hoffer. Have you encountered Matsadi before this? I have, answered the German. In that you have the advantage of me. But from what I have heard of him, he is a man who plans with considerable effect. Is it likely? And he bent toward the other slightly. That he would stop at one man in the crowd? The thick jowls of Hoffer bulged, and a dull red crept into his face. You mean... He got this far, and then stopped. You think, he continued, after a moment, that there were more than Okiu? I know it, said Ashton Kirk. I counted at least three. Matsadi is not restricted to the use of his own countrymen. The man who dropped the revolver, for example, was an American. At that moment, Fuller, his face wearing an anxious expression, looked into the room. Seeing Ashton Kirk, he hurried to him. This, said he, holding out a message, was just handed in. I told the man that I would look you up. Ashton Kirk took the envelope, murmured an apology, and tore it open. There were but a few lines, and he read them at a glance. Then he handed the paper to von Stunenberg and arose. It seems, said he, that everything is about ready for me, and I really must go. Saw Matsadi come out just now, read the German ambassador. Two men who had preceded him signaled from across the street. He joins them, and all three hurry to the Japanese embassy, have building surrounded, and am awaiting you. Kalbasan! Von Stunenberg lifted a crimson face as he finished the message. The rats! he cried. They have beaten me! He handed the paper back to the secret agent. As he did so, his countenance cleared somewhat, and he smiled grimly. And also, he added, with some appreciation, they have beaten you. Not quite, replied Ashton Kirk, coolly, as he buttoned up his long coat. I have still a card to play. You would not dare. Hoffer paused as though the act the other had in mind were too daring to even put into words. Not in a foreign embassy, he added fearfully. But the secret agent smiled. If the search for what I desire leads me to a foreign embassy, why not? asked he. What I ventured in the German, surely I shall not hesitate to repeat in the Japanese. And now, gentlemen, I must say, good night. And with this he left the room and hurried down the hall, Fuller following close behind him. End of chapter 23
by John Thomas McIntyre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pete Milan. Chapter 24 Surprised When Ashton Kirk and his aide reached the sidewalk, a man in a cloth cap approached. Mr. Culberson is awaiting orders, said he. Tell him to call off his men, replied the secret agent promptly. Without comment, the man in the cloth cap walked away. Fuller was amazed. You have changed your plan? Our affairs do not wear the aspect they bore when I called upon the Culberson Agency for help, said the secret agent. There was an unemployed taxi cab by the curb a little distance away. They got into this, and in a short time were put down at their hotel. The secret agent asked some questions of the clerk, which the latter seemed to answer in the negative. Then they ascended to Ashton Kirk's apartments. The secret agent threw himself into a comfortable chair and drew a tobacco pouch toward him. As he rolled a cigarette, he said, We must lie idle until I get a call from Burgess. He is in Washington, then? Yes. I had a few words with him over the wire while at von Stunenberg's. The secretary told him that I was there. Through the open window, the drone of the night could be heard. It was now perhaps two o'clock, and the city was deep in sleep. From somewhere in the distance, a car could be heard passing now and then. Occasionally the smooth hum of a motor, or the sharp clup-clup of a cab horse sounded nearer to hand. In silence, the two young men sat smoking. Half an hour went by, and then the telephone rang. Brusquely, Ashton Kirk sprang to the receiver. Hello, said he. The voice of Burgess made reply. Everything right, said he. I followed them from the embassy to the Tillengast. The Tillengast? Yes, I'm speaking to you from there. I will be with you in a very few minutes. Then, as an afterthought, the secret agent added, They are all there, I suppose. They all came here, yes and they held a consultation in a small reception room on the second floor. After this, the young fellow went out. I see. Those men of Culberson's came in mighty handy. One of them followed him. He has not returned? Not yet. Very well. Ashton Kirk hung up the receiver and reached for his overcoat. Is it the Japs? asked Fuller, expectantly. But the secret agent shook his head. No, said he, it is not the Japs. But, and the other noted the speculative look come into his singular eyes, I rather think we shall see something more of those very interesting personages before the night is over. A cab took them to the Tillengast in less than a quarter of an hour. It was a huge, ornate place, showily furnished and glaring with lights. In an office floored with marble and rich with gilt and mirrors, they found Burgess, engaged in conversation with a clerk. He greeted Ashton Kirk eagerly. "'You are just in time,' said he. "'The young man just came in, and two Japanese were with him.' Ashton Kirk smiled, as though well pleased. "'I rather fancied that he had gone to fetch them when you told me that he had gone out.' said he. I hope, said the hotel clerk, earnestly, that this matter is nothing that will harm the credit of the house. Not in the least, Ashton Kirk assured him, smoothly. It is more than likely that it will never even be heard of outside ourselves. The clerk breathed freer. In that case, said he, it's all right. And now, gentlemen, seeing that it is a government affair, if there is anything that I can do, I will do it cheerfully. Thank you, replied the secret agent. As he spoke, there came the sound of a buzzer. A youth at a telephone called, A waiter in Parlor F. That's the parlor your party is occupying, 
said the clerk, interestedly. Hold the waiter until I can speak with him, said Ashton Kirk. He considered a moment. This parlor F, he added, does it communicate with any other room? Yes, with parlor G. Excellent. After a few more questions, to which the clerk returned pointed answers, Ashton Kirk gave Fuller and Burgess some low-voiced instructions. And now, he said to the clerk, I will see the waiter, if you please. The man was a Swede, with sandy hair and mild blue eyes, and his name was Gustav. Gustav, said the secret agent, how long have you been a waiter? Fifteen years, replied the Swede. In that time, said Ashton Kirk, you should have learned your business pretty well. Gustav grinned mildly. Oh, yes, said he. Ashton Kirk handed him a coin. When you go into Parlor F, said he, forget what you have learned. Be clumsy. Make a noise. Do something that will draw people's attention to you for a little. Again, Gustav grinned. I will forget, said he, slipping the coin into a pocket. The peoples will not be pleased, but I will forget. That he kept his promise was evinced by sundry crashes and exclamations, which came from Parlor F shortly after. And in the midst of these, Ashton Kirk entered the room adjoining and unlocked the communicating door. Then Gustav retired, followed by a series of remarks in a voice that was strange to the secret agent. And for a few moments, there was no sound save for the clinking and clash of glasses. Such a clown, said the voice. Such a clown to be sent to serve gentlefolks. It could happen in no other country but this. Will you please come to the matter in hand? said the gentle voice of Okiu. You sent for us for a specific purpose, and we should be greatly obliged if you would hold to that, Mr. Karkowski. Karkowski laughed in the manner of a man who was very well contented with himself. Of course, of course, said he. Business is always a pleasure to me. Especially very profitable business such as this will prove to be. We do not ask your price, said a voice which the secret agent recognized as that of Matsari. We merely desire to be certain that the paper is ready for delivery. You may rest assured upon that point, replied Karkowski. Drevenov, show him the scapular. There was a moment's pause, during which the secret agent could well imagine the young Pole drawing the desired object from his pocket. There, said the triumphant voice of Drevenoff. There it is. And see here where the edge has been opened. The paper. Karkowski laughed once more. Ah, said he contentedly. These little matters. What a time we have in hunting them out. What a chase they sometimes lead us. And how glad we feel when it is all over. There would have been no chase in this matter at least, said Matsari, if you had lived up to your word in the first place. Not my word, my dear sir, spoke Karkowski. That has always been good. But one cannot always depend upon the steadfastness of a boy. I am as steadfast as you, broke in the voice of Drevenoff. But blood is thicker than water. I will not deny that, said Karkowski, soothingly. Then, as though turning to the others, he added, It happened this way. This was a wild lad. Russia drove him out. He fled to this country. When his father came with Count Melikov, they became reconciled. He was permitted to return home. But he was a Pole. He hated Russia. 
and beside that I pointed out a chance to make a fortune. He stole the document which we now have here. And then, said Okiu, you opened negotiations with Tokyo, and when all had been settled, you would not turn the instrument over to us for the price asked. That, said Karkowski, was the result of the indiscretion of a very young man. I could not turn it over to you. Drevenov had given it to his father. What else would you have me do? demanded the young Pole, warmly. Could I see him wrongly accused, disgraced? No. I returned the paper, told him what I had done, and stood willing to have him do with me what he would. But his father, said Karkowski, was afraid to act. He feared for himself and for his son. He hid the paper in his scapular, and when dying gave it to the English physician. He was afraid to trust the Russian. He dreaded to risk giving the paper into the hands of one who might profit by it. I know that was his reason, because I knew my father, said Drevenov. But the Englishman attached no importance to the scapular. He placed it among his effects and forgot it. If my father gave him any instructions with regard to the disposal of it, he also forgot them. I reasoned out what must have become of the scapular when this young man came to me after his father's death, said Karkowski. He was then willing once more to join me in the sale of the paper, because, and the man's laugh was full of mockery, there was no near and dear one who could be harmed by it. Because you would sell your soul, Karkowski, said young Drevenoff. Don't think me a fool if I would not. I beg your pardon, said the elder Pole. I meant no offense. And as to selling my soul for so little money, don't believe it. If I ever come to such a transaction, my dear child, the price will be of some consequence. And when you reasoned that the English doctor must have what you desired, said the smooth voice of Okiu, you began your operations? At once, answered Karkowski. We took ship to England, located him at Charlesdale, and went to work on the matter. We tried everything, but with the same lack of success. From what you said a few moments ago, said Matsari, you think that Dr. Morse was unaware of the document's existence? At first I did not dream of such a thing said Karkowski. And indeed, it was not until after he had come to America that it occurred to me. On going to Charlesdale, I tried to open negotiations with him. I tried the same here. But in neither case did he rise to the bait. But now I am convinced that he never knew the thing was in his possession. Matsari laughed. Then Okiu, said he, all your planning was wasted. So it would seem, replied Okiu, gently. We suspected that you had some hand in the queer communications which Dr. Morse received from time to time, said Karkowski. We knew that it was not by chance that you took the house directly behind him. Drevenoff, with a laugh, tried to get your man to talk many times, but could not. Humadi, said the Japanese agent, never talks. Here there was a sort of rustling sound, the swish-swish of silken skirts over the floor. Then a new voice spoke, a voice which made Ashton Kirk breathe a quiet sigh of content. I think you have rambled long enough in this thing. It will not benefit any of us in any way to know what the others have done to gain possession of the paper. That it is here is, I think, sufficiently to the point. There was a subdued clapping of hands at this. Bravo, Julia, cried Drevenoff. To business, I say, that is what we are here for. Exactly, spoke Karkowski. That is what we are here for. The price is what was named before, interrupted Julia. 
and the paper is to be delivered when the money is turned over. Tomorrow? asked Matsari. Tomorrow will do very well, said Karkowski. Read the money, no checks or drafts. Cunningly. They are things not always to be trusted. The hard coin or the downright banknote. That is what pleases me in a case like this. Tomorrow at noon, said Matsari curtly. There was a drawing back of chairs and the sound of several persons arising. You can be seen here, I suppose? Yes, replied Karkowski. We will come here. Have the money in large bills, if possible. With a laugh, we don't care to be loaded down if it's to be avoided. It shall be as you desire, said Matsari. Then there came the sound of footsteps crossing the floor of Parlor F, and a door opened. Good night, said Matsari. Good night, replied the others. Softly, Ashton Kirk opened the communicating door and stepped into the room. Karkowski was just about closing the door leading into the hall. At his side was Drevenoff and a girl with flaxen hair. As the door clicked behind the Japanese, the girl threw up her hands and laughed triumphantly. Alexander, she cried, it is ours at last. We have won. In spite of all they could do, in spite of the clever American, we have won. She threw her arms about the neck of Drevenoff. But as she did so, there came a queer throaty cry from Karkowski. And then, for the first time since he had entered the room, she saw Ashton Kirk. End of Chapter 24《Chapter 25 of Ashton Kirk, Secret Agent》by John Thomas McIntyre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pete Milan. Chapter 25 Caught. The expression upon the faces of the three as they gazed at Ashton Kirk were of mingled amazement and fear. But the secret agent only smiled in return. The twinkle in his eyes was altogether humorous. I know, said he, that I am exceedingly annoying in happening here, especially at such a time as this. But you see, we all have our tasks in life, and mine is to convince people that things are seldom what they seem. There was no reply, and the secret agent fixing his gaze upon the girl, continued. That you think I am clever is a compliment for which I thank you. It is hard, with a smile, to be indebted to a person and be able to make only a, so to speak, left-handed return. The girl was the first of the three to recover. She stared at the speaker unflinchingly. And that is she asked only that in saying that you have won you made a slight mistake don't be too sure that it is one she said then with a fierce bitter ring in her tone she added there would have been no mistake had i had my way a few nights ago the secret agent laughed ah no said he i can well believe that you urged our friend here, nodding toward Drevenoff, rather strongly, to be sure. Drevenoff's face was waxen with increased fear. The wide open stare of his eyes grew more marked. He was about to say something, but before he could do so, Karkowski spoke. Who? asked the elder Pole. Is this gentleman? The girl laughed in a mocking sort of way. An amateur policeman, she said. Perhaps you have heard of him. His name is Ashton Kirk. 
Karkowski seemed to ponder, but at length he shook his head. No, said he, I do not recall the name. Then, to the secret agent, would you mind stating your business, sir? You would make an excellent comedian, Mr. Karkowski, said the other. I do not recall ever having seen that so well done before, and when one considers how many times the device has been used, that is saying a great deal. Drevenov took a step toward the speaker. What? demanded he. Did you mean a moment ago when you spoke of my being strongly urged? So? Ashton Kirk darted a keen look at him. That attracted your attention, did it? He remained with his eyes upon the young man for a moment, and then continued. You seem to have a habit, when dispatched upon messages, of seeing to your own affairs first. I recall, reminiscently, that upon the night of the murder of Dr. Morse, I asked you to go for the police. I did so, said the Pole. Oh, yes, to be sure. But you took occasion first to fasten a window which had been previously neglected. For an instant it seemed as though Drevenoff would cry out. But with a great effort he held himself in check. I don't understand you he said. I sympathize with you in that, said Ashton Kirk, because there are many things I do not understand myself. For example, and he wrinkled his brow as though in an attempt to recall something, I do not understand how you escaped the eye of the man I had at your heels the other night when Miss Corbin sent you to the city. Was it by a leap from the train while it was moving? He shook his head in strong disapproval. That was dangerous. A quick look passed between the three, but the secret agent proceeded. There are some, however, who are willing to take chances, no matter how desperate. Then again, there are others who dislike to risk anything. You, for example. And he looked once more at the girl. Refuse to run risks of a certain sort. You are one of those who believe in clearing the way of obstacles as you come to them. That, and he nodded appreciatively, is an admirable effort. But to be absolutely effective, it should contain a dash of imagination. For then, if one were planning a murder by illuminating gas, for instance, one would realize the result of a raised blind. A grass plot is an excellent background for the shadows cast by a strong light. Again, the quick glances were interchanged, and then Karkowski spoke briskly. We have listened to you, Mr. Ashton Kirk, as you must admit, with a great deal of patience. So you will pardon me if I insist upon your stating the nature of your business without further loss of time. Ashton Kirk looked at the fresh-faced little man with his frank, well-opened eyes and well-fed figure, and a look of amusement came into his face. As to that, said the secret agent, I am entirely at one with you. I desire to finish my business as quickly as I can. I was here upon much the same effort as the two who just left, he continued, but there is this difference. They were willing to pay for the paper contained in the scapular, while I expect to have it handed to me for the asking. Karkowski sat down and crossed his legs much after the manner of a man who is interested. The young man and the girl remained standing and were silent. A paper, said Karkowski, as he stroked his chin thoughtfully. Will you kindly be more explicit? Again, I felicitate you upon your talent, said the secret agent. You were meant for the stage. He sat upon the edge of the table and nursed one knee with his clasped hands. But let me assure you that you are but wasting your breath and your ability. He paused for a moment 
and then went on. If everyone concerned in this matter had displayed a like degree of talent, things might not have turned out as they have. Let me suggest to you, to the girl, that you make an effort to change your style of handwriting. If you continue in your present trade, you can't hope for success while possessing so noticeable a characteristic. For the first time since his discovery of the secret agent's presence, Karkowski lost his presence of mind. He uttered an exclamation. The postman, smiled Ashton Kirk, told me of Mr. Kendrick of Low Street, and it did not take a great deal of time to reason it out that you and he were one, and that the second address was a ruse to throw the police off the track should there be any need of it. The man who had you in charge also had orders to keep an eye out for a woman, for the handwriting which had so attracted the attention of the postman, together with some other little things, had told me that a woman was concerned. But, as a matter of fact, he never had a glimpse of her until you went to meet her at the station and boarded the train for Washington. On the journey here, he occupied a chair in the same car. He is a clever man, sneered the girl. Quite so, but there are things which are out of his line. For example, he has not been able to find out how you obtained entrance to the von Stunenberg house. But that you did enter he knew, for he watched you as you went in. And then he called me on the telephone and described you. I knew that I could not mistake you, with a little bow for there are not many of your market type, and if that were not enough, your costume is unique. Well, said she, I did not see you take the paper from Miss Corbin, said Ashton Kirk, but I was quite sure that you had it for all that. And you allowed me to go? The girl sneered once more, but Ashton Kirk shrugged his shoulders. It made no great difference, said he, quietly. The man who watched you enter was watching you when you left. His arrangements were such that only a miracle could have permitted your escape. For a moment, the three were silent. Then young Drevenoff spoke. You heard what Okiu and the other said while they were here? All that was essential, I think. I know that you have the paper, and this being the case, it is to you whom I now direct my attention. By that, said Drevenoff, I suppose you mean that you expect me to give it up. The secret agent nodded. I credit you with some common sense, said he, and therefore think that you will do so. The young man was about to answer, but Karkowski stopped him. The elder then bent toward Ashton Kirk. His usually good-humored eyes wore an entirely different expression. His round face was set and hard. I perceive, said he, in a cold, even voice, that there is nothing to be gained by further evasion. We have the paper of which you speak. We have it after several years of constant effort and the reward that was to follow the finding of it is all but in our hands. He rose, and his small figure seemed to dilate as he proceeded. Perhaps you heard this reward mentioned a while ago. It is to be a large sum of money, paid by the Japanese government. But do not suppose that we— And he waved his hand so as to include the other two hoped for personal profit. Ashton Kirk shook his head. I do not suppose so, said he. Some few facts, which I gathered as to your reading at the public libraries, gave me an idea as to your purpose. Humanity, declared Karkowski. Its development and progress, that is our creed. This money was to help fight tyranny, as represented by Russia. 
the Japanese, whom we have dealt with, know nothing of our intentions, for they, too, are ruled by a tyrant. And we fear that rather than advance our cause, if they knew the truth, they would forego leveling at your own country a blow which they long to strike. We have given ourselves to this thing, he went on, have stopped at nothing. No chance has been too desperate, no hope too small. And now that, as I have said, the reward is all but in our hands, do you think we will pause, that we will weaken in our purpose, that we will surrender the paper to you because you come here and demand it? If you do suppose so, said Trevenoff, you do not know us. You are only one. If we failed before, it does not follow that we will fail again. You are right, Julia, to the girl. I should have used the revolver you offered me instead of the gas. It would have been sure and would have saved us further trouble. Ah, said the secret agent. So it was a revolver she offered you. I recall your refusal of it very well. And I also recall, thoughtfully, that it was a pistol shot which ended the life of Dr. Morse. Perhaps she also offered you the weapon in that instance. What? cried the young Pole. Do you mean to say— But Ashton Kirk interrupted him. I mean to say, said he, that I know you were in the library on the night of the murder. Wait! As Drevenoff seemed about to interrupt him. Do you mean to say that you were not in the library that night, secretly? Do you mean to say that you did not steal down the front staircase, unfasten a rear window, and admit a woman? And do you mean to say that you did not make a search, and in doing so cut your hand upon a glass drawer knob? Drevenoff gasped, and a wild look came into his eyes. In a moment the girl was at his side, whispering soothingly to him, all her defiance gone, her manner soft and anxious. "'If I were to tell these things in a court of law,' said Ashton Kirk, and he shrugged his shoulders, "'and then followed them up by showing your entire willingness to take human life, as demonstrated by your venture with the illuminating gas. Do you think there would be much chance of your escaping conviction for the murder of Dr. Morse? Drevenoff shook himself free from the girl. His face was white, and he trembled from head to foot. But the wild look of terror in his eyes had given place to one of desperate resolution. Karkowski seemed to read the look, and what it told him, apparently, agreed well with his own inclinations at the moment, for his hand stole to his pocket, and he took a forward step. "'You would have us in a law court, would you?' asked the younger Pole, in a husky voice. "'And you'd put a rope around my neck. Well, maybe you would, if you got the chance, but you have not yet done it, and you will not!' With the last word, he leaped upon Ashton Kirk, his hands gripping at his throat, and at the same moment Karkowski drew a shining object from his pocket. What would have happened would be difficult to say. But at the first sign of violence, Fuller, Burgess, and some others burst into the room. Karkowski was seized, and the younger man was torn away from the secret agent. The latter readjusted his collar with one hand and smiled quietly. To grip a man by the throat is a very primitive mode of attack, my dear sir, said he. The very best authorities have set their faces against it, for while you are so engaged, you leave yourself open to more or less deadly counter-movements. But as it happened, this, and a scarlet something showed in his hand, is the only thing that happened to you. I was too seriously engaged in picking your pockets to think of anything else. What reply Drevenoff made to this did not seem to interest the secret agent a great deal, however, for he turned his back upon them all, and, under a light, began making an examination of his find. 
they caught the rustle of paper and saw him place something carefully in his pocketbook. When he finally turned, his aides were about leading the prisoners from the room. At the door, there was a halt. The girl turned toward him. It's too late to deny anything in which we have had a hand, said she, disregarding the muttered warnings of Karkowski. But the one thing with which we had nothing to do, I will deny. Neither he, pointing to Drevenoff, nor I killed Dr. Morse. I admit everything else, but that one thing we did not do. Ashton Kirk said nothing, and the girl went on. Drevenoff did admit me to the house on the night the doctor was killed. He had searched for the paper everywhere, and knowing that I was clever at such things, he asked me to help him. It was for the same purpose that I was in the house on the night we tried to fix you with the illuminating gas. But, and her hands went up dramatically, we did not lay a hand upon the doctor. He was seated in his chair, dead, when we went into the library. If he was murdered, and her voice sank, I can indicate the guilty person. Who was it? asked Burgess. It was his secretary, Warwick. You did not see him do it? It was Fuller who asked the question. No. But after we had searched everywhere, we heard the sound. I was just about to open a bag which I saw on the floor, and Drevenoff whispered to me to run. I did so, taking the bag with me. I had stepped out of the window and was looking about when Warwick leaped out after me and seized the bag. I tried to tear it from him, but could not. Then I ran, leaving it in his hands. There was a silence for a moment. Then she added, what I have just said is the absolute truth. If you are even half as clever a man as you are said to be, to Ashton Kirk, you will find this to be so. And with that, she followed Karkowski and Drevenoff from the room, each guarded by a stout plainclothes man. End of Chapter 25《Chapter 26 of Ashton Kirk, Secret Agent by John Thomas McIntyre》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pete Milan. Chapter 26 The Truth Ashton Kirk, after Burgess led the prisoners away, turned to a telephone and in a moment had the office. A gentleman will probably ask to see me in a little while. If so, send him here. And as he turned toward Fuller, that young man said, in a dubious sort of way, What do you think of that story which the girl just now told? Can there be any truth in it? It is all truth, said Ashton Kirk, quietly. All truth? Fuller opened his eyes to their widest extent. Then you have made up your mind Warwick is the murderer. Ashton Kirk smiled. As to that, said he, we will allow him to speak for himself. I expect him here at any moment. Here? Yes, replied the secret agent. And then... As a low knock sounded upon the door, he added, More than likely, that is he now. In response to his come in, Philip Warwick entered. Closing the door behind him, he advanced slowly, and then paused, facing Ashton Kirk. I believe, said he, quietly, that you desire to see me. He was rather pale and obviously nervous, but for all that he made a good attempt to appear at ease. "'It was very kind of you to come at this hour,' said Ashton Kirk. 
Will you sit down? The young man did so. I did not know just where you were putting up, proceeded Ashton Kirk, and so had to call up one hotel after another. I was at the Carlton, said Warwick. I got the call a half hour ago. And now that I am here, with a squaring of his shoulders, will you kindly be as brief as possible? Brevity suits me exactly, said Ashton Kirk. But before making a beginning, don't you think it advisable to secure the presence of one more person? I think, significantly, she has returned from von Stunenberg's by this. For an instant, Philip Warwick hesitated. Then he went to the telephone, and in a very few minutes there came a knock upon the door. Fuller opened it, and Stella Corbin entered swiftly. With a cry she ran to Warwick, and he put his arms about her protectingly, while his eyes seemed to defy the secret agent. "'And now,' said the latter, after the girl had gained control of herself, "'suppose we make ourselves as comfortable as possible, and then come at once to that which has brought us together.' When all were seated, he resumed. There are a great many points in this case which remain to be cleared up. Some of these, and his eyes searched their faces, are things upon which you two only can throw a light. But the girl and the young man remained looking at him coldly and in silence. He smiled. Your present attitude is not unfamiliar said he to Miss Corbin. I think, reflectively, that I noted it first upon the day after the murder of your uncle, when we met you upon the stairs. And, his brows lifting in polite inquiry, as you had just finished a somewhat earnest conversation with your neighbor Okiu, I've often wondered just how much he had to do with my loss of your confidence. You are right, said Stella Corbin steadily. It was Mr. Okiu who first told me what many things have since convinced me is the truth. He was passing the window where I stood that morning, and stopped to express his sympathy. We entered into a conversation, and he told me of the paper. I had never heard of it before, and he told me that you were endeavoring to become possessed of it. But I believed in you then, and replied that you had been engaged by Mr. Warwick to clear up a mystery which surrounded my uncle. However, he said he knew your methods. You had, no doubt, in some insidious way caused yourself to be suggested to Mr. Warwick for the— Stella! cried Warwick, in astonishment. Is it so surprising that this should be true? she asked, turning to him. Have not much more surprising things happened of late? Warwick made no reply to this, but directed a look toward the secret agent. One would have thought, said the latter composedly, that Okiu's being so manifestly an interested person would have weakened the plausibility of his story. But, and he smiled as he went on, perhaps he did not divulge the real nature of the paper. He caught the look that came into her face and added, I see that he did not. A clever man would not, and Okiu is really very clever. He paused for a few moments, as though expecting either one or the other to speak. But as they did not do so, remaining cold-faced and unbelieving, he resumed, I see that there is very little that I can say that will tend toward re-establishing our first friendly relationship. And this being the case, we shall waste no more time upon the attempt. He took a notebook from his pocket, and turning over the leaves, said, Here I have the main points of the affair of Dr. Morse, from the time of your visit to me, nodding to Warwick, until the time Miss Corbin removed the sought-for document from the candlestick in the library of the house on Fordham Road. At this, the girl started up with a little startled cry. 
but Warwick drew her back with a whispered warning. The secret agent smiled. You seem surprised that I should know just where you found the paper, he said. Do you forget that I was in the house on the night that it was done? There was another brief pause. Then he went on. However, in tracing out this matter, I have come upon indications and have arrived at conclusions which may surprise you still more. His turning of the pages of the notebook stopped, and with his finger marking a penciled entry, he said to Warwick, This woman in New York, have you settled your matters with her? It was now the young man's turn to show discomposure, but it was for an instant only. A woman? said he, inquiringly. I don't think I understand. Of course said Ashton Kirk, with a gesture. It is your privilege to assume any attitude you choose, but I must say that I consider this one faulty. There is a woman, and she insists that she has some sort of a legal claim upon you. This you deny, and Miss Corbin believes you. Mr. Warwick, exclaimed the girl, warmly, has my utmost confidence. Thank you, smiled Ashton Kirk. We will now consider the existence of the woman as having been admitted. He settled back in his chair and went on. Some time ago, Dr. Morse received a number of letters. They were brought to him by a second woman, one whom you, to Warwick, did not know. A quick look of surprise passed between the girl and the young man, but they kept silent. From that time, said Ashton Kirk, easily, there was a decided feeling between Dr. Morse and his secretary. Quarrels were frequent. He was not careful as to his words, and you resented his brutality. On the night of the murder, he struck you, looking at Warwick. He struck you in the face. And you, turning his eyes swiftly upon the girl, saw the blow, and were glad. Glad! The girl echoed the word. Yes, I was glad, because I knew that that would mark the end of your hesitancy. To Warwick. I knew that you would act, that you would not be content with merely denying... Ashton Kirk nodded. If you had read my notes, said he, tapping his book approvingly, you could not have made a statement more in accord with them. He looked at them for a moment, and then went on. Dr. Morse had made up his mind finally to interview this woman. He had placed the letters in his handbag and was preparing for the trip, when you, to Stella, convinced him that he was making a mistake, and succeeded in obtaining his consent that Warwick make the journey with the letters instead. Am I right? You are, replied Warwick. I had known this woman, in explanation. She heard of my intended marriage with Miss Corbin, claimed that she was my wife, and forged certain letters to substantiate her claim. The entire matter was absurd, though Dr. Morse chose to regard it seriously. But at last he did consent to giving me the letters, permitting me to seek out the woman and force her to tell the truth. I see, said Ashton Kirk. It was while upon a landing of the back stairs that you were told that the letters were in the handbag in the library, and you at once went to get them, meaning to catch the next New York train. Miss Corbin went as far as the lower hall with you, then returned to her room. You entered the library. It was dark. A sound attracted you in the rear room. You went toward it, and as you gained the doorway, you saw a woman with the bag in her hand step out of the low window to the lawn. You were there, cried Warwick. No, smiled Ashton Kirk. Some of the things which I have told you were seen, 
or heard. Others I have gathered from signs. I have merely connected all of these by reasoning out what must have occurred to bring about the results that followed. I did see a woman step out upon the lawn, said Warwick, and I followed her. Of course, said the secret agent. You knew it was a woman who had brought the letters to Dr. Morse, and that you had not seen her is shown by the fact that you suspected that the woman with the bag was the same. You fancied that she had somehow learned of Dr. Morse's intention to turn the letters over to you, and in fear of what you might do, and knowing that the letters were palpable forgeries, she had effected an entrance to the house and was trying to make off with them. If it occurred to you that she had been exceedingly quick to gain her information, and had suspiciously little trouble getting into the house, you might have suspected the collusion of Dr. Morse. As you had a deep-seated aversion to him, this thought would have been natural enough. As a matter of fact, said Warwick, slowly, what you say is practically the truth. But, and there was a strong curiosity in his voice, it is not possible that you have reasoned your way to this. Ashton Kirk smiled. Most things to which we are unaccustomed seem difficult, replied he. This particular conclusion was arrived at very simply. It is based upon the fact that you did not give an alarm. Had you thought the woman was a housebreaker, you would not have contented yourself with taking the bag from her and watching her make away. And as young Warwick was staring, deeply struck by this explanation, the secret agent continued. But tell me, what made you re-enter by the window after she had gone? To have an understanding with Dr. Morse, but I got no further than the back room when I changed my mind. That would wait, but the railroad wouldn't. If I became involved in a quarrel with him, I might miss the train. Ah, I saw your tracks upon the window sill, showing that you had gone in that way as well as come out. But your reasons puzzled me. He will observe, smiling, there are some things for which I cannot supply the answer. I passed around the back of the house, just as the newspaper said, spoke Warwick, and leaped the fence. I did this to save time. I had no idea what the hour was and did not wish to be late. It was then that the Japanese saw you, said Ashton Kirk. Okiu sent one of his men to follow you thinking something was in the wind. It was this man who was afterward found dead in your room at the New York Hotel. He got into the room during my momentary absence, stated Warwick, who now seemed not at all backward in rendering help. I came upon him just as he had slashed the bag open and removed the letters. These I snatched from him, and as he leaped at me, I knocked him down. In a rage at his defeat, he then killed himself, Japanese fashion, before my eyes. Knowing that I should be held for an explanation of this, and not wishing to become involved in a delay at that time, I managed to slip from the hotel without being seen. Later I saw the account of Dr. Morse's death in the newspapers, and learned that my sudden and secret departure had caused me to be suspected. But I determined not to make my whereabouts known until I completed the business which took me to New York. This I did very effectually after I found the woman I had sought. Then I returned. First, said Ashton Kirk, you communicated with Miss Corbin, made certain arrangements with her on the telephone, and then paid a visit. You had probably recognized the Japanese of the hotel room as one whom you had seen about Okiu's. This had aroused a suspicion in you that probably Okiu knew more of certain things than anyone else. "'What you have said is quite correct,' said the young man, composedly. First, I intended making an open visit to the Japanese, and made my way to his house for that purpose. But I saw you entering at the front door and changed my mind. Miss Corbin had spoken of you with some suspicion over the telephone. I thought it best to take no chances, 
and at the same time I wanted to learn more about the Japanese and your apparent intimacy with them. So I entered secretly from the rear of the house. However, I had not gone further than the first floor when I came upon you in the dark. Ashton Kirk laughed, and touched the patch of plaster with a fingertip. You strike a sharp blow, he said. But tell me, what had Okiu to say when we burst through the door into the lighted apartment? Warwick shook his head. There was no one there. I saw that it would not do to leave you, so I lifted you and carried you out of the house by the rear door. I meant to call attention to you, and after gaining the lawn behind the house of Dr. Morse, I heard someone opening a door. I placed you upon the ground and stepped back. It was Drevenoff who came out, and he found you almost instantly. I thank you, said Ashton Kirk, not only for that good service, but for your willingness to speak. He turned to the girl and added, Perhaps it would help matters greatly if you were equally willing. Believe me, Okiu had his reasons for implanting suspicion in your mind against me. He was quite right if he told you that I was searching for the paper concealed in the scapular. I knew that it was in your uncle's possession after my first visit to Fordham Road, and made up my mind to have it. But murder is not my business. I gain my ends by other means. Tell me, said the girl, and she bent a little toward him. Have you gained your end in this case? I have, returned the secret agent. She gave a little gasp. It was you, then, who took the scapula from me at the embassy. He laughed and shook his head. No, he answered. It was not. It came to my possession only about a half hour ago. He looked at her for a moment, and then went on. I will not ask how it came into your possession, or, rather, how you knew of its being in the candlestick, for I already know. You know? She arose, her face white. He nodded. Yes. And here his voice sank. I also know who killed your uncle. Her hand went out, trembling. Her face was so bloodless that Warwick sprang up, alarmed. You are sure? she asked, quaveringly. Again, the secret agent nodded. I am quite sure, he said. End of chapter 26、Ashton Kirk, Secret Agent by John Thomas McIntyre This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pete Milan. Chapter 27 Conclusion At an early hour next day, Ashton Kirk paid a visit to the secretary. What passed between them can only be guessed, but that the scarlet scapular and its accompanying document was one of them is a certainty. Then the secret agent, accompanied by Fuller, boarded a train leaving Washington and went speeding homeward. Fuller, though sorely troubled, managed to contain himself until he had almost finished the journey. Then, as one unable to combat his curiosity any longer, he said, I wonder how many of those things which old Nanon suspected regarding the Corbin girl are true. Without turning his eyes from the flat country which whirled by the car window, Ashton Kirk said, There are a great many well meaning people 
whose views or statements cannot be accepted without great risk. Nanon is one of these. Then you do not believe what she told you upon the various occasions when you talked to her? Ashton Kirk proceeded as though he had not heard the question. As we saw at almost the first glance, the woman is a fanatic. She hated pagans, as she termed the Japanese. She feared Morse because of his views. To her mind, he was possessed by a spirit of evil. This feeling grew so strong in the course of time that she began to feel that even his surroundings must necessarily be evil, that those who possessed the same blood, or for whom he cared, must be filled with demonic impulses. That is probably so, said Fuller. Something of the sort occurred to me once or twice after you told me of the things she said on the day she visited you. He was silent for some little time. His mind seemed to have turned to a fresh matter for bewilderment, for he finally said, I heard all you said to Miss Corbin at the Tillengast, and a great deal of it was plain enough. But what I can't understand is the affair of Okiu, Miss Corbin, and the taxicab. She was seen to enter the cab with the Jap, at a time when she had in her possession the thing which he desired most in the world. And instead of taking it then, he preferred to wait and lay a rather ornate plan which was not at all sure to succeed. The story of the old watchman, whom we talked to at the drugstore that night, gave me some hours of hard work, said Ashton Kirk. And I burned up quite a bit of tobacco before I finally worked the truth out of it. He turned toward his aide lazily and asked, Suppose there had been two taxicabs instead of one that night. Two? Fuller did not seem to grasp the suggestion. Okiu got into one. It turned and vanished around the corner. Then a second appeared, coming from the direction in which the first had gone. As taxis are unusual in Eastbury at night, the watchman never dreamed but that it was the same one returning. But, protested Fuller, he saw the Jap open the taxi door. He said so, yes. But after I had considered the matter, I went to him and asked a few questions. It was as I thought. He had taken the cab for granted in the first place, and he took the Jap for granted in the second. But Okiu bought two tickets for Washington. One was for his confederate, Humadi, who joined him at the station. The second cab then... Fuller paused expectantly. I hunted it up. It had been engaged by young Warwick. He and Miss Corbin had agreed over the telephone to meet at a certain hour upon the corner where the policeman noticed the girl waiting. Warwick went to secure the cab to take them to the station, and was delayed in some way. As he did not appear, she evidently became nervous, fancied that she had made a mistake, and that he had really named the corner above as the place of meeting. She had started for this, when his cab turned the corner, halted, and took her up. Yes, yes, said Fuller. I see now that that could very readily have happened. But, with a lift of his brows, if the Japanese were not in on the finding of the scapular, why did they take it into their heads to bolt so suddenly for Washington? The attempt upon me had failed, returned Ashton Kirk. They feared to remain without instructions, and so hurried to Washington to lay the facts before their superiors. Burgess noted them upon the train, and was a witness to the amazement they showed at sight of Karkowski and his friends. However, none of these latter saw the Japanese. Okiu, as I think I have said before, is a clever man. He saw that something was ripe, or considered to be so by the Poles. 
and so he clung to them secretly after they had reached the capital. And within an hour he had learned that Miss Corbin was at the Tillengast. The observation of all this was a deft piece of observation upon the part of Culberson's fellows. They are much more deserving than I ever gave them credit for. There was quite a long period in which nothing more passed between the two men. Indeed, the train was slowing up to stop when Fuller asked, You have given up all thought of the girl or Warwick having had any hand in the death of Dr. Morse? I never had any such thought, said Ashton Kirk. To be sure, smilingly, they puzzled me more than a little from time to time. The girl's fear of the police, from the very first, was a thing that interested me. But that may be safely attributed to a natural uncertainty. There was bad blood between her lover and her uncle. Perhaps the former, in a fit of rage, had killed the latter. She feared this possibility, and in consequence, dreaded the police. And the shoes with the caked soil upon the soles? As I remarked at the time you discovered them, our own shoes were in like condition. Okiu is a resourceful, secretive man, said Fuller. And being so, why did he tell Miss Corbin of the paper? Her knowledge of its existence could not benefit him in any way, and her possible discovery of it could only have hurt him. Ashton Kirk laughed. By telling her what he did, he gained a valued aid. He had planted an unwearying searcher in the house, which he could in no other way enter. If the girl found the paper, so he figured, she would at once acquaint him with the fact. And I have no doubt but that this is the very thing that would have happened had not Warwick arrived with his newly created suspicions of the Japanese. They took a taxi at the station and were speeding toward the house of Ashton Kirk when Fuller spoke again. Several times, said he, I have heard you say that you know who killed Dr. Morse. I suppose that today we'll see the arrest of the murderer? Ashton Kirk nodded. Yes, said he, I suppose so. The driver of the cab was paid and dismissed, and the two entered the house. Anyone here, Stumpf? asked Ashton Kirk. Mr. O'Neill and Mr. Purvis, replied the man. These two were seated in a room off the secret agent's study, engaged in conversation. How is this? demanded Ashton Kirk, rather sharply. I thought that either one or the other of you was to remain at the Fordham Road place until I called you off. Well, seeing that the regular police are there, said O'Neill, we thought we could ease up a bit. The regular police, exclaimed the secret agent. Then you didn't get my wire. Yes, the regulars are on the job there now. The old servant is dead, died while sitting muttering over her prayer book. It was perfectly natural, I feel sure, but the police, in view of what has already happened in the house, are going to take no chances. The two men had gone, and Ashton Kirk sat smoking a cigar in his big chair. A while ago, said he, you said that you supposed that today would witness the arrest of the assassin of Dr. Morse. And I think I agreed that it would. But now... He stopped and shook his head. Fuller regarded him for a moment. Then an expression of incredulity came upon his face. By George, cried he, surely you can't mean that. I mean that it is too late, interrupted Ashton Kirk. He drew at the cigar reflectively for a space and then continued. The thing, as far as I could learn, happened this way. 
One day, while still at Sharsdale, Nanon, in turning over her employer's belongings, came upon the scapular given him by Colonel Drevenoff. She was horrified at the thought of so holy an emblem being in the possession of such a blasphemer, and at once all sorts of reasons for his having it occurred to her. She had perhaps heard of the Black Mass, and fancied, no doubt, that she had come upon evidence of some such another sacrilege. She quietly took the scapular, therefore, and hid it. And she never told him? Not until the night of his death. Then she was called into the library, as she stated. And in some manner the thing came out. I talked with her as to this later before leaving for Washington, but she could give no clear account of it. However, I think he uttered some sort of a taunt, as was his habit, and she replied in kind. The meaning of the drawing sent by Okiu had gradually dawned on her, it seems, and she had concluded that the suspense which he suffered because of them was a sort of retribution. She must have put this thought into words, and in an instant the truth was out. In a rage, he took a revolver from his desk. She did not know whether it was merely an attempt to frighten her or no. However, she feared for her life and snatched at the weapon. It exploded, and he fell back into the chair. Yes. It was old Nanon who killed Morse. She concealed the revolver upon her person and went to the front door, where she sat for some time, as she told in her first story. She was calm and self-contained. She felt that she had done no wrong. And so she concluded it would be best to find the body when she brought in the coffee? Yes. And while she was engaged with this, Drevenoff stole down the front stairs, admitted his woman confederate to the room back of the library, and discovered the dead body of Dr. Morse. Then followed the fear-filled search. The approach of Warwick added to their fright. They evidently carried a pocket torch, which accounts for the library being dark when Warwick entered. Then the girl, Julia, made an effort to escape with the bag, and while Warwick was in pursuit of her, Drevenoff crept back to his room. Fuller nodded slowly. Yes, said he. It could very easily have been that way. But tell me this. The old woman knew all the time that she was responsible for the death of Morse. So why did she manifest so much uneasiness whenever Warwick was mentioned in the matter? She was alarmed at his disappearance because she was shrewd enough to know that this would attract attention toward him. There were two reasons for this. She felt kindly toward Warwick and so disliked his being falsely accused. Then, if he was arrested, she would be forced to confess the truth to save him. She had these things in mind when she withheld the fact that she had seen Morse strike the young man. She claimed to have heard voices in the library while she sat upon the step. Now Dr. Morse was dead at that time, and none of the others had yet gone into the room. The voices were a fiction. She thought to mislead the police by the invention. Or, perhaps she really thought she heard them. I did not question her very closely upon this point. A woman like that is apt to see and hear things which do not exist. Witness her suspicion of Miss Corbin. She fancied that for some dark reasons the girl was making an effort to have the crime fixed upon Warwick while professing to love him. That Miss Corbin had been long under the influence of Dr. Morse made this idea, to Nanon's mind, not only possible, but probable. 
This thought grew upon the old woman until it seemed she could scarcely think of anything else. Her constant espionage finally attracted Miss Corbin's attention, as she told me at the Tillengast after you left the room. In her turn, she began to suspect and watch. With the feeling that the scapular should be well hidden, Nanon placed it in one of the candlesticks, cunningly calculating that as the article had once been searched, it would be passed by thereafter. And Miss Corbin saw her place it there, suggested Fuller, quickly. Exactly, and awaited an opportunity for obtaining possession of it. When did you first come to suspect that Nanon might have the paper? asked the aide, with curiosity. At the time we hit upon the fact that the drawings received by Dr. Morse were meant to represent scapulars. What had actually happened at once began to take form in my mind. And feeling sure that the old woman had the paper safe, without, possibly, knowing of its existence, I made no attempt to obtain possession of it. And I did not fear Drevenoff's finding it, because I was convinced that they would never dream of her having it. The speaker sat for some time smoking in silence. Then he added, I was about ready to tell her what I knew, secure the paper, and hand her over to Osborne on the day she paid me the visit. But the story she told rather gave the matter the air of further entanglement. And so, to learn first how deep was the apparent involvement of Miss Corbin and Warwick, I postponed the arrest. I should think, all things considered, said Fuller, that you'd be rather glad that it happened so. I am, replied the secret agent. She was without real guilt. And, with a nod to his aid, the meaning of which that young man did not fail to catch, as there are but a few who are possessed of the facts, she will, I think, continue to appear so. End of chapter 27